Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine. Currently, I'm a um, showrunner's assistant on on the Nickelodeon show. Um, so that's, I mean, I, I'm very lucky to be in this position. Um, but my goal today is to share you basically the most important things that I've learned um, and how to break and write a great story. Right. So breaking story into the writer's room. Um, there's going to be two parts to this presentation. Um, part one, I'm going to go over more of the writing components, right? Like what's going to be in the writer's room, um, pitching in a breaking story, and essentially how do you craft a good story? Like what are we essentially looking for um, uh, uh, as writers, right? And then part two will be more focused on like, how do you even get into the room in the first place? Um, and what are the different paths of getting there? Cause there's not like exactly one path, right? Um, so I think it's important to just touch base that um, as a TV writer, your goal is to write for someone else, right? So when you're a TV writer, you're not really writing your vision, right? This isn't going to be about your show. Um, uh your voice and everything is going to matter though so uh know what you can bring to the table right and then always pitch something that appeals to you um so as a writer like our commodity is our perspective our voice our opinions our experiences that we have in life so um if you've uh worked in a fast food restaurant or um went to Costa Rica or something, those are all experiences that you can bring to the table, right? Um, and what's very important more than ever is like uh, minority stories, uh, stories of people who, um, uh, and yes, this uh, session will be available on YouTube later, um, but uh, that's going to be very important for your perspective. Um, so, when you start to break story in the writer's room, we actually first start with pitching, blue sky pitching. So for example, uh, your season is has 26 episodes or even 52 episodes, right? Um, this is a this is a part where you try to fill in what all those episodes are, right? So what's an idea? If you're pitching for SpongeBob, what if this is a, a episode where SpongeBob gets jealous of Patrick for something, right? Um, and then the most important thing you have to remember is for your core idea, you want to make sure it's relatable. That's number one, right? Um, because your show can be canceled if um, if your stories can't relate, uh, can't be relatable to the the audience, right? Um, so if you're writing for kids six to eleven, kids six to eleven have to be able to relate to some of these experiences and like the characters. Um, so think back to your childhood. What is something that happened or that you want to see on screen, right? Um, for example, uh, I, if the story is about a Chinese American person, I went to, uh, I had to go to Chinese school on the weekends. So that's an episode that I could write about, right? Um, and then relatability also has that emotional component as well. Um, something else you want to really pitch is things that are fun, right? Um, kids, a lot of the like story and the plot and the emotional moments are important. That's what connects us to the characters. But sometimes like the Thor line of what uh, of plot, right, um, is lost on kids. So you want to really make sure it's fun. Um, what's that fun moment that we all want to see on screen, right? Um, and then second thing is you want to, when you're pitching, you want to make sure it makes sense. And that's where theme comes in. You want to make sure you have a really strong theme, a theme that um, is relatable, right? Because um, theme also brings in that like point of view. What's your, what are you trying to say to the story and whose character's story is it? And then always make it simple. So uh, you, I bet all of you guys have written log lines before, um, which is like one sentence or two sentences at most about your um, about your episode or pilot that you're writing. Um, so make sure it's very easy to understand. And the more easy it is to understand, the better, right? Um, and then when you actually pitch the story, uh, think about how you will pitch it. 
how you will pitch it is as important as what you are pitching. Never forget that. You can have the best story ever and then you kind of read off of it um, from a notepad or something. That's not going to work. Um, like I've seen people pitch and they're just literally reading something that they had and that's that's not good. Um, so if you're pitching something super funny, you have to be laughing and like uh, having a good time while you're pitching, right? Otherwise, the person who is on the receiving end probably won't know uh, what's so funny about it. Um, so he, you can take a screenshot of this if you want. Um, just remember when you are coming up with an idea, brainstorming idea, you wanna make sure your story has all of these. Um, uh, and then something I really wanna highlight in today's session is theme, right? Like why is theme important? What if the story doesn't actually have a moral lesson or isn't like, you're not hitting that moral lesson so hard on the head. Um, theme is theme is important because it sh not only shows you your perspective as a writer, right? Like what you're trying to say to the story, but also whose character story it is, right? Um, if there's two characters, that's if there's two characters like SpongeBob and Patrick gonna go to um, to Squidward's house, right? Whatever SpongeBob is learning will be different from Patrick, right? Um, sorry, these are very basic uh, examples on the top of my head um, for for right now. Um, and then the steps of creating a story, right? You want to start with blue sky, like brainstorming, just coming up with um, the the most, I mean, like literally anything. This is a moment where you can scrap ideas, come up with new ideas, right? You don't want to do that in the rewrite or the writing phase, which does actually happen sometimes on um, not all shows, but some shows. And then um, breakdown. So this is this is what you're doing in the writer's room. Um, you're not gonna usually you're not gonna be doing this alone, right? Um, you're gonna have a team to help you break this down, uh, your story. And then you actually write it and then rewrite it. Just think of it as these four steps. Um, the first two steps are gonna be in the writer's room uh, because you usually want like the story editor with the showrunner's uh, perspectives on it, right? You don't have the green light to just, oh, go ahead and write a script um, before this happens because we wanna like, your team wants to be on the same page as you about everything. And uh, the more, the people at the more senior levels, they have great insights early on about like how to make your story better. Uh, step, yeah, step three, you usually write by yourself um, and then you rewrite. So rewriting is when you're taking EIC notes, like executive notes, um, showrunner notes, uh, story editor notes, right? Um, but if you disagree with any part of it, always remember it's a discussion, right? You're not fighting back on the notes. It's we're all just trying to make the best story. Um, so share your perspective. Um, if you do every part of this correctly, if you do the first two steps, blue sky and breakdown, writing isn't really a step, right? Because, you know, writing and rewriting, like just once you have the breakdown, all you have to do is like like barf it on the paper right you just get out your first draft get out um even if it's bad because most of the work will be in these other steps right especially breaking down and rewriting um so again with the theme right rewriting is really important because that's the moment where you clarify every single beat around the theme and then make sure that there's no part of your story that confuses. So um, yeah, you're basically addressing all the notes. I would say rewriting is key to writing. That's what differentiates a bad writer from a great writer. If you're able to take the notes and um, know how to rewrite really well, I know which notes to take. Um, for blue sky pitching, just always remember if you're going to take anything away from blue sky pitching, the biggest thing is relatability, right? What's that moment that connects with the audience, right? Um, think comedically and emotionally. And then breaking down, uh, the most important thing to a story is that the midpoint, 
right? Because if you think about what story is, story is a character that goes through um, a journey to learn something, right? Midpoint is that part where someone realizes something. Um, the other parts of the story you have is setup, midpoint, and resolution. And then we'll go through what each of these parts mean. Um, so for the midpoint, here's an example. John meets a date for the first time, but then they discover that date only eats pizza crust, right? So it's a, it's a, this, this again is a very, uh, simple example is not a great example, um, but I hope it illustrates the point. Um, so John goes on a date for the first time, discovers that their date only eats pizza crust, dun, dun, dun. Maybe that's a deal breaker, right? Um, the hunters are after a deer to kill, but then discover they are being hunted by the deer. This is a moment where you're watching like Parasite um, by Bon Joon-ho, and then uh, you think that the main characters are, you know, after more money, they're going to win, but then they go deeper into the mansion and then discover something completely different, right? Um, this is also the part where it keeps the story more interesting because you have something going on in the first half of the story and then all of a sudden it switches on you, right? And that switch will get your audience through the rest of your script. Um, resolution is important because, you know, you have to make a point or, uh, this is where your perspective comes into play. So for example, the first example, um, John meets a date for the first time, but then they discover their date only eats pizza crust. They get married. Wow. This was not what I expected. Right. Or he decides to never online date again. So the writer or even the character, John, um, have two very different perspectives about this. And that's why like having a very clear, decisive resolution matters. But it was really confusing, right? Like, why did they get married? So this is why setup is extremely important. Sure, like most of the fun beats are usually in uh, the middle and the end of the script. But if you don't set up correctly, you're going to confuse your audience. So John only eats pizza toppings like that's something you have to set up so uh when they discover their date only discovers pizza crust they get married right so if she only eats or he only eats pizza crust and then he only eats pizza toppings right then it's it's perfect but oh john is allergic to pizza so then he decides to never online date again because this was a traumatic experience for him that's a very different uh that's a very different story right um so resolution matters but this was a little bit surprising and then here you have the full story um so when you're actually breaking down you have now set up you want to think of that as act 1 right? So what do you want to have by the end of act one? You want to make sure that the character goals are clear, they've embarked on their journey. Um, midpoint is um, act two, essentially, um, but you can think of it easier as act 2a and act 2b. Everything that happens before the midpoint and after. And then resolution, you have act three. And then just to reiterate, this set up midpoint resolution, you want to make sure you have that for pretty much every detail in the story. So think of it largely, right? But for every joke, like every punchline, every joke, it's going to feel random if it comes up, I mean, if it comes from nowhere. But if you set a joke up correctly and every, every character motivations correctly, then your story will make a lot of sense. Um, Set up just, yeah, goals have to be clear by the end. And then act two B, think of it as, you know, the abyss or that big emotional scene. You also want to think of story as we're, we're writing a story, right? To get to that big emotional scene where that scene that people want to see. What's that big moment that you're selling? Um, like, what is this? What's that Oscar worthy moment where it's that character has that monologue? Or what is that scene that the actors will want to play? Right? That's your act to be, or sometimes even your climax in act three. 
um add to it you want to think about as it's not just filling up like you're not just filling it in between act one and act two b act two a is when you really show the character decisions that lead up to the midpoint right where they realize where they realize something and they want they have to fix things or they don't realize it and then they fall into the abyss right like they make a decision that sends them there so um and then the ending Yes, just uh, reiterating should inform your theme. And then once you figure out this part, you want to go back and to make sure every single thing is tied back to that thing. So it's uh, set up, just make it even clearer, right? If your theme is um, like, don't lie or something, then make sure your setup and uh, in your setup, the character believes that it's okay to lie or something. That's a really bad example, but um, I hope that clarifies um, what, what I mean. Um, also remember that your breakdown is just a skeleton. So once you're done with this, your script should never just be these bare bones, right? Um, you want to add that fun back in because that's what we're really here for, right? Um, no one just watches Fast and Furious because it's just Vin Diesel saying family and then they defeat the bad guys and they get out, right? You go you go watch Fast and Furious because of that crazy moments, the parts that don't make sense. I think it's like uh, Dom Toretto like blocks a bullet just by flexing or something. Like those are the moments that you're actually watching that for. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you want to add that meat to that skeleton. So what would that be? code open right how are you going to sell your story because most of the time people only read the first three pages probably even the first page only before they decide to move on or pass on your script right so that's the moment where you're just like okay don't just make setting up on like um like oh dom toretto has a family there's a bad guy blah blah blah, blah. throw us right into the action or throw us into something very interesting about the character from the get-go. If you're writing an original pilot, who is that who is that character that you're selling? For example, the boss in the office, right? When he um when he first talks, that's that's your whole cold open. You're selling us on those characters, even like it doesn't have to be an action sequence, right? Um and then think Again, just reiterating, thinking of Act 2B, that big emotional scene and the big climax in Act 3 as also like the parts that um, you that are the meat of the story, right? Um, this is how you're going to get actors and the producers on your script, right? Uh, actors want to win that Oscar. Um, and then you want to make sure that every other part, part is punched up or has something fun or funny going on. So add all of the sparkles throughout. But how do you do that? Character. Answer always lies in character. You can be pitching a fantasy world, um, like some kind of magical component, right? That's just an extra thing to set up. The world is always an extra thing to set up if it's not like in a grounded reality. Um, but the thing that people come back to time and time and time again is character that's why you have you know like the office and the and friends who are so who are um like these shows make so much money and people go back to them even 30 years later right um so character is comedy right character is the best form of comedy it's better than just premise comedy because premise comedy you have a premise um it can be repeated three times and then it dies but that's it it's just that episode but characters is what takes us into the next episode and the next season character is a story right so remember um Every story has to have a character attached to it, as in it's a character story. There's a reason why this specific character is going on this story, this plot. Because um, you can't match like a different plot with a character that doesn't really fit. Um, it just won't be as emotional, like it won't resonate emotionally as well. Character is, yeah, so you want to make sure your character is relatable and it's going to get you that next episode. It's literally everything. 
um it's so much more important to have a really good character and to understand that character really well than um just thinking of things in terms of plot um if you develop your character last after you come up with all of the other stuff you're going to be in trouble it's just going to take a lot more like rewriting to do um and i would also say never pitch a story or um well i mean you can pitch it but never write a story where you are breaking your character for the sake of a joke um when you watch tv sometimes you're going to run into that and be like oh that's not something a character would do right um and then you you ruin the character <laughs> and then that show won't last as long right um so sorry that was a lot um but once you're in the writer's room how like what are things you can talk about how are you going to speak in the writer's room right and especially coming in as an assistant or a script coordinator sometimes like for the first time you don't know what to say especially if people talk all the time and people will be like talking all the time it's going to be hard to get a word in sometimes because you know this you have like five or six people in the room who are trying to break the story and you're the you're the new person right so always think about what are things your showrunner likes? What are things your writers or the person who's writing that episode or your story editor like? Then those are things that can, like your, your pitches will be more successful in that way, right? How do you si simplify the story? These are things you can ask like, oh, we have this story so far. How do we simplify it? Um, what is working? What's not working for the character story so far? Uh, what part of the story appeals to you? So you can be like, if we're all brainstorming during like blue sky pitching, you can say, oh, this part of the story appeals to me because I came up with a house, I mean, I came, um, I grew up from a household that was just like this, right? Um, and then always remember how to differentiate from other episodes. So if you already had a whole bunch of episodes centered around um one kind of style like if it's investigative or something try to try to make it something else try to do something else with that episode and then always remember that your value as a writer is your own experiences and that's very valuable so when you're at a loss for words think back to what are things that i can contribute as a writer um so you can also screenshot this i just came up with a cheat sheet um to like you can fill in the blanks if you're at the loss for words right um and just remember that you don't always have to have something to say like sometimes the best thing to do is to listen right because this is this is how I got this I know I'm sometimes I'm an extrovert sometimes I'm an introvert but mostly I'm an introvert and I um I freeze too um and something else you can bring up is check in with each of the characters so okay everyone's like deep into the story take a step back and be like huh let's say this is a family sitcom when um would daniel do that would the dad do that would the grandpa do that how about the little sister right like what um you can always bring that up like okay we talked about um the main character for a while but why is the little sister doing this right you can never go wrong okay yeah best thing to do is to listen and always remember that like as an assistant in the room or a script coordinator in the room it's okay if you're not like pitching all the time or um like contributing story-wise you're juggling other things other people are there for one thing right to break the story to be a writer you're there to to schedule to do conforms to like to take notes there's so many other things that's on your mind so it's gonna be okay um so now we reached part two of the presentation how do you want to be a writer so how do you be a writer right um how do you get into the writer's room you're gonna when you go to like other writing panels there's gonna be two things that you hear right 
there's going to be a live action track versus an animation track. Most of the writer centric um, panels and workshops and stuff revolve around the live action track because there's, you know, that's the majority of where the writing is, like the writing industry, right? Animation is an even smaller world within that. So um, we'll start with animation. Script coordinator, right? You want, to, essentially, you want to be a script or coordinator because that's going to give you all the freelance scripts uh, that you're going to be in the writer's room and you get to go to the reports, right? Going to the reports is like going on set for live action. It's great. You get to see how the actors are taking your script and what changes we're going to make at the record. Showrunner's assistant. I'm a showrunner's assistant. Don't be confused by the naming. Sometimes on a job listing or something, this is called executive assistant. So executive supporting producers were creative producers on a show. Executive assistant on the show is the showrunner's assistant. The good thing about showrunner's assistant is you literally see everything. You're not siloed in just the writer's room. Um, but, you know, you also likely won't be first in line to get those freelance scripts though. But um, you get to, um, you still, depending on what your supervisor or your showrunners think, right? You get a chance to be in the writer's room. You can, like in my situation, I'm able to just be in the writer's room whenever. Like I can go in as much as I want. Um, and in my situation, I'm actually the one handling records. But leadership proximity is everything. Like you're you're being taught by the line producers, uh, by the showrunners, um, and you get to see the the directors, the storyboards, the edit, like basically float around anywhere. And that's the thing that I really like about the job. And you schedule everything, like literally everything on the show. So you get to literally put every single step on. Um, of the show onto that calendar. Um, in live action, you're going to hear there's a writer's assistant position, which exists in animation, but it's not often. Um, writer's assistant is where you want to be and not script coordinator, because script coordinator is a more senior position. Um, script coordinators, I believe, go on set more. Writer's assistant is in the writer's room taking notes. And when they think of like, oh, who's going to write an episode, they usually think of the writer's assistant first, um, which is a less senior position to the script coordinator. And you also have a showrunner's assistant. So in animation, the script coordinator role is actually the writer's assistant and the script coordinator role combined. Um, and then um, all, almost, all animation writers started as an assistant. This is just what like a lot of professionals like managers and stuff that I've met with and um, other people say. Anim like animation writing is very connection based. Um, people tend to hire and promote people that they trust, right? So more so than even live action, a lot of people started off from the assistant track. It's not completely 100%. Like there's people who graduated from school and bam, they got hired as an animation writer, right? But the majority have started as like PAs and then they moved up eventually. Salary, I know you guys are all thinking about salary. Um, across the industry, so this isn't to represent any particular studio, you're looking at around like 18.75 an hour to 24 an hour um, and some like especially live action some is still on that low point um but some studios for some studios like once you hit that 22 23 dollar mark that's like coordinator range base rate adds agencies so like to get into a live action track you usually start um at uta ca like an agency those start at 22 an hour um around now they set the bar higher. So the rest of this may change, uh, hopefully. Um, but also know that this, th it's difficult to get in as assistant. Jobs aren't a lot, right? And you're not being paid a lot. So if you look at like other like 
places outside of animation or even government agencies, um, you, you make a lot more. Um, assistant self-defense. So I, once you're an assistant, just remember, um, I would choose an assistant role where people can see the work you do, right? Because I'm assuming you all work really hard. Or people can see the work you do, you doing the work. Um, because the more people who know you, those are the people who will help you get that next job, right? Um, if you only primarily work with one person, uh, that's not a lot of power. As an assistant, when things happen, sometimes people will ask you for help to take on someone else's job or do their job, right? Always, I tend to like to put everything in public channels so this doesn't happen to me, right? Avoid DMs. And then don't say yes to every. I mean, you want to say yes to a lot of things like, oh, Catherine, do you want to like do this? Yes, I do. But if someone's like DMing you for something particular, like, oh, can you do this for me when it's not your role? Ask why, right? So then you have a record because if you don't ask why, your supervisor will, right? Um, so this is just my word of caution for you. And then I like to stick to email for receipts of information. Um, the assistant track, again, is not right for everyone. Not everyone has that opportunity to, to be an assistant because like, you, uh, it's, it's first hard to get in. And second, um, it's, it's stressful, right? You're going to be juggling writing and doing the assistant track. Um, and sometimes you want to make sure they're financially secure first, like pay off your debts, right? Um, and also, so this, I would say, is a chart, it is a general chart for getting to that staff writer position. Um, a lot of people start at agencies or PAs or EAs, right? I would think of these first three, agency, EA, PA, and WASA, as around like, the same entry level position. Um, you could get in as a writer's assistant without any previous assistant experience, but that is extremely rare, right? People usually save those roles for people who have already been assistants before. And this chart is just based on your proximity to your staff writing goal, right? Um, and the other reason why is the assistant track takes a long time. Right, you you're dependent on other people for your promotions, right? And the industry really, really relies on recommendations. Um, and then you're gonna have to think like to be promoted, that's gonna take like around one one year, one point five years or more, right? So calculate that time in your head. Um, so you could go that assistant route or you could write your way in. And let me explain to you what I chose and why this was my journey, right? Um, when I graduated, I graduated in 2020. So I graduated into the pandemic. It was like a really bad time for me. Um, I, I um, co connected with like a lot of uh, people who were hiring interns who were, I, I actually wanted to be a storyboard artist originally. Um, and I was applying to all these programs and I was deep in it. Like I almost got something a few times and all of a sudden it just went away. So we didn't like the industry shut down right when COVID hit. And, um, at the time I was like making my thesis film. So I just put all of my work into that because I wanted to make something good. My goal is to make good content. Right. Um, and that film did really well. So it, it won a lot of festivals and everything. And then um, I, I said, okay, if jobs weren't open, what can I do to get into the industry? I decided to work on pitches, like my own pitch Bible. So I took my really successful short film and then I turned that into a whole pitch Bible about my family. And illustrated like graphic novel style and stuff, right? And then I pitched it to a studio and then they wanted to auction it. And I, I negotiated to them with a lawyer. I said, essentially, like, no, because I felt like they weren't, um, they were just trying to take my story without paying me properly. Um, 
And then I took that same pitch Bible and then I just cold emailed it to a whole bunch of executives. Uh, and most people, like no one got back to me except Netflix. And then I got my first general with Netflix and the exec there asked me, do you want to, what do you want to do? Do you want to create your story or be a writer, right? And I thought about it and I said, I want to be a writer. Where are your samples? I didn't have any samples ready. So then I was like, okay, give me two months. I'll get you your samples. So then I took my samples. I mean, I mean, I took those two months, three months, and then I turned in my samples. And then that led to a uh, staff writer interview and an apprentice uh, writer an interview, right? Um, so I thought, I don't need to go the assistant route. I can just get in this way. And yes, you definitely can, right? So um, during the pandemic, um, a game, which is a uh, networking opportunity for Asian writers, um, also hosted a lot of general meetings for writers with um, with executives across the industry at that time. So I was I was just meeting with execs and execs and execs, and I was submitting my writing directly to them, and then um, that would get me my job opportunities. So I interviewed, and and some I found on a portal actually. But I interviewed for four different writing positions, staff writer, writer apprentice, associate writer positions. And um, I didn't get any of it because they keep asking me, have you been in the writer's room before, right? Who do you know and stuff? So I was in the running, I knew my writing was there, but then I, I had to build my connections. So there are people who made it in just if they were persistent doing that over and over and over again. I was getting desperate. I wanted income. I like to have a safety net. So I said, okay, I'm going to start applying to PA jobs again. I'm just going to apply to both. I'm going to keep doing that and then get PA or any other kind of assistant jobs. And because I did both, I started off as a PA on a feature. And then that specific PA job got me my showrunner's assistant job because I had a direct connection that um who who knew me on the movie I was on who took me onto the show right so um I kind of tried both um there's no right answer right um uh, but I realized like for me I needed that connection to get me in because I was getting stuck at these interviews um for writer salaries what's your goal right so why are you being an assistant what's the money that you'll be making? The minimum would be around $50 an hour. And then this will change, the, you know, the next time we negotiate with uh, with studios as part of TAG. Uh, so always check on the Animation Guild website for the most updated wages. And this is location specific. So this is assuming you're like in the LA area to be in TAG, right? Also know that WGA writers for live action make two times more of that for the same work done so if so always think in twos right assist so tag writers make around two times more than assistants um live action writers make around two times more than that um writing sample strategy right what i keep hearing is make sure when you write your writing samples write live action and write older i didn't follow those rules I wrote four like original animated pilots for kids, right? I didn't follow these rules. But generally what you're going to find in the industry is live action samples can be used for animation writing samples, although not ideal, but seldom is it vice versa. You can't really use an animation sample to get you that live action job. Um, samples for adults can be used for, oh, sorry, can't be used, wait, sorry. Yes, samples for adults can be used for kids in preschool, but preschool can't be used for adult comedy. So the hierarchy is essentially uh, adult comedy sample can be used for kids animation, which can be used for preschool, right? But not the other way around. Whether you think that's fair or not, probably isn't, right? But this is just what it generally is. And then you're also going to find that nearly all the fellowships are live require live action re original samples not animation 
right? I didn't follow in, I didn't follow the strategy at all. I stuck with animation samples, but um, the smarter way to go would be this. Um, also, just know that you have time because being a writer is many people's midlife career switch, right? A lot of really successful people got into this business and they're like, when they're 35 or something, right? Um, a lot, there are very few um, writers in animation and live action who say, oh, I want to be a live action at 20. I mean, I want to be a writer at 20, right? Um, so you have time. It's going to be okay. Um, and then I'm done finally with all of this. So um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. And I'm going to stop screen sharing. Do you mind if we unmute for our questions? Yes. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so you talked about uh, like a bad pitch, for instance, would be like reading off of your note cards. Can yeah. you give like some examples of like different ways that a pitch might be like unique or like special? Okay, um, the thing that I really, so I've took, I've been taking classes at UCB comedy, which I actually really recommend that every comedy writer take. You're gonna find people who, um, there are some people who actually own, especially in live action who only hire people who've done UCB, right? Um, so definitely put that on your list. But what I learned from there is you wanna be, you wanna act as, a, you can act as a character. So let's say um, we have a character who um, every time, again, really bad pitch, who every time they wanna break up with someone, they do the robot dance, right? So if that's funny to you, when I just pitch it to you, it's not as funny. But if I perform it and I'd be like, uh, uh, I, I have something to say, right? And then you actually start performing it, then it's funnier, right? And it's more memorable. And those are like direct quotes that you can actually pull into your script later. <laughs> Does that help? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. And a lot of it is also enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. I I I want to ask, um, is this the writer's assistant job safe or something? Because after the AI happened and everything, uh, do you think this writer's assistant job will be preferable? Yeah, I think it's well. We never know with AI, right? But I do think it's safe because assistant jobs, right? At the end of the day, count kind of like production style. And then we always need people to manage the artists, to take take um, information, put it on the calendar, right? We all, always need people to facilitate, like humans, right? Um, so I would say like anything that's more on the production side of things because it's so people heavy, I don't think those are gonna go away anytime soon. Because the job involves you to like talk to people and um, facilitate, right? Yeah. Okay, then that's it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, hi, Alex. Um, so I know how you mentioned that um, one of like the ways you got a writing job is like being on set as a PA and then making connections through that. Um, how exactly as a PA do you get connections? Is it just like socializing? Or... Um, so I was not a live action PA. I was a PA in animation, right? And um, to get to that next job, be really good at your job, right? Like, no, be someone that you can, tr that people can trust. Because a lot of the assistant jobs are really hard. They're really hard. Um, You have to like, there's so, so many meetings that they show up to. And there's so many like, uh, it's like just managing the calendar can be hard because you have to memorize like 20 people's names, right? That have to be added. And then I don't, it's just, it's a very hard job. If you can do it well, right? And then you can be someone that people can trust. So if I say, Alex, can you help me with this? And you're like, I got it, I got it done. 
and then you actually follow through and get it done and you're someone who's like cheery someone who like doesn't who's not a debbie downer and like um uh, makes people sad or me or is mean or something someone's going to recommend you for that job next job right be yourself um and then if that doesn't even work that's on them they lost they lost a good soul so thank yeah. you yeah I have, a, I have a question yes so you said about how writing and animation and all of that is very like connections based you want to like know the person or like they want to know the person uh for like making the connections um for getting to know people with, like these connections what are your recommend what are your recommendations because like not everyone can like is in like this california like hollywood area it's like what is your recommendation for like getting these connections like in an online area in like an on online context or do we have or would you say we have to move to los angeles yeah but when i got my okay so I um I originally went to USC, so I already had some kind of connections, right? Um, so look at the connections that you already have first, right? If they're not animation or film related, think about who can vouch for you and who can help, who is adjacent to the industry, right? The other thing is I moved out of LA during the pandemic, and maybe it was a pandemic situation. But I had to, but even then during the pandemic as an assistant, I still had to move back. Like my requirement as an assistant was to move back to LA to, to get the, to have them offer me the job. That was the condition. Um, and there are still a lot of jobs who are remote, but most often you're gonna find that assistants have to be in person, whereas everyone else doesn't, doesn't or some leadership doesn't, right? So it's not essentially fair because, you know, we're all aware of high rent and everything, and it's very difficult. But um, having an LA address really helps. Some recruiters only hire people who are close to the studio. Um, ask a friend, right? That That's what I would say. Is that the same in like the New York area? Um, I'm not very familiar with um, the industry on that side, but generally um, if the job is located in New York, it's best to be able to say, oh, I can relocate if needed, right? I hope that answers your question. Okay. I I had I have one question. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, so I'm an anime. I'm I'm working in the animation industry. I'm a board artist. Okay. Have you seen or heard any any co uh, colleagues that have gone through that way, going from yeah. animator into a writer position? Because I do pitches for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, like I've been pitching for three years, so I'm curious if you've heard the same stories of people going the other way from animation into writing writers into animation vice versa so animation is kind of run by board artists right so a lot of showrunners come from boarding and okay. a lot of directors come from i mean they all come from boarding right so okay. board artists have a lot of power you can actually like if because every script that's written right it goes through board artists you usually punch up you, like you'll find yourself mm -hmm. even if it's like a um script oriented show sometimes board artists punch up sometimes they change things right because it's still a discussion even at that phase depending on the show that you're on yeah. uh, people love board artists right because you practice so many like pitches right like that's part of your job there's mm -hmm. so many people who have gone from board artist to writer Okay. And a lot like you'll hear about a lot of showrunners, especially those who come from boarding, who prioritize board artist perspectives. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Let me see. There's some questions in the chat. 
when do you know that a pitch bible is ready to be shared with studios do you have to ignore the fact that someone could steal your idea when you're sharing a story what is the kind of legal work that needs to be done so uh don't worry about people stealing your idea um you can copyright your work but what you're going to find is your like your story could be similar to a lot of what's already been pitched right because these execs are looking at like Hundred, they've probably seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pitches so um usually when you submit something you have to sign an nda for them to even look at it not not an nda a, um a disclosure form where you can't sue the company right but um for even fellowships i just applied to the nick writers fellowship and that one i had to i had to sign something so I don't sue them if they come up with something similar to it, because no, no one's out here to steal your material. Um, if anything, the material doesn't have that much weight. It's the writer that does. When people want to hire, they want to hire you more than the writing sample itself. Does that make sense? So why would they burn that bridge with you, right? Um, yeah, uh, you can also get copyright at the, so there's a U.S. government copyright if you are located in the U.S. There's also a Writers Guild registration. You don't need the Writers Guild registration if you already register with the government, but that one's more expensive. Um, uh, when do you know a pitch Bible is ready to share with, uh, with studios? Uh, I guess find people who are in the industry who can look at it um just like a script right when do you know your script is ready you share it with a lot of people well, my first script I shared with like 50 different people you know before it was ready because I didn't know what I was doing um and then eventually when um the notes that you're taking are less objective and they start going into the subjective category um or territory that's um that's when you know it's ready right? When you're starting like, oh, I don't know if this will actually make it better. But that should happen like a lot of revisions in. Um, trying to get a copyright here has been three months. Okay. Yeah. Right. Writing also changes a lot. So I wouldn't copyright something in the early stages either. So I would start registering it right before you're about to uh, send things out. Um, but make sure you're sending out to people you trust and people who give good notes that you trust, right? Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you said earlier that uh, when you got contacted by that Netflix, a person at Netflix, you got uh, you got asked if you wanted uh, to have your own show or if you wanted to, to get into writing and you turn down uh, having your own show, is there a reason why? And if you went with that option, how do you think it would have went? Well, when my connection was, uh, she she was interested in me, right? Which is why she asked that question. Um, so she wanted to help me, which is why she's asking that question, right? If I were to say, okay, I want to have my own show, I'm going down the development track, which means um, for a set, payment um or not even like i'm not even paid to pitch does that make sense i will be making revisions and pitch taking their notes making the revisions coming back with a new pitch making the revisions then coming back with another new pitch right that's on my own time so if you have the money to stay afloat right um, and at the time I was, I, I went back during the pandemic and lived with my parents because I didn't have a job, right? I could have taken that route, but I want, I kind of want a job, right? I want something that makes me income. So that's why I chose the writing route because development can take years. It's like, usually, I mean, you've heard of movies and shows that's gone into development for like five years. Two years is like not a lot, but five years, you know, and sometimes they shelve it. And then if they auction it, if they buy it from you, they can, I mean, as a new writer, you don't have that much weight, right? If they buy your pitch and you've been writing for like four years, good. 
then you can say, oh, I want to be the showrunner on this, or I want to be a story editor or something. But if you're not in the industry yet, they don't know you yet, you're not proven, right? They're just going to take it from you for like a set amount of money that isn't going to equal even minimum wage of the amount of hours that you put in. So make sure you get a name for yourself first before you make your show, right? And again, there's people who's like not done that before. Like I, I bet whoever pitched like Avatar probably didn't have to go through all of that, right? There's people who've pitched shows and made it, but they haven't been a writer or a board artist and they still got showrunner status. Uh, but for the majority, you want to make sure that you have um, that leverage behind you. I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. And uh, I wanted to, to continue on that by asking, do you have any idea when uh, you call the email someone, your pitch Bible, how much time are they going to give your pitch Bible? Do you need to get their attention in the first page? And how do you keep their attention? So they keep uh, reading. Keep their attention the first page. Um, I would say at the time, I wasn't like the best writer, right? But I was a good artist. So um, I made my pitch Bible look really awesome um, and unique, right? So art, people can't not look at it, right? Um, you see art, you're like, oh, I've seen it uh, with the script. Oh, I still had to read it. I still had to process, right? So that was the strategy I kind of took. But generally, yeah, people will probably take a look at the first page or not even open it and put it down. So um, if you're cold emailing someone, be like, oh, I know you because blah, blah, blah recommended that I reach out to you. Or you can say um, like, oh, I've won this and this awards for my script right i was like a austin i was on the blacklist i was on at the austin film festival like winner or student academy or something right write that down and then just you can call email managers that way and stuff i remember i submitted a really awful sample to a manager at gotham because i was like yo i got all these and he like he wanted to read my stuff but I just didn't have the samples to prove it back then. Uh, so that fell through, but he was open to it because of the other stuff I said about myself. Because remember, they're interested in you. Yeah, I, I hope see. that was, yeah. Yes, and I want to further build on that by okay. asking, do you think that you can, uh, one can uh, reuse their pitch Bible for a show, for like a graphic novel, a comic book, or something else, take your artwork and... You absolutely can. Um, I'm less familiar with those industries though, right? Um, but I highly encourage you to pursue other paths of producing your own work, for sure, right? You know this, like right now, this is an IP world. So if you can make a name for yourself with your webtoon or something else, then, uh, then do so, yeah. I see, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, hi, Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you talked a lot about um, entering into the um, writer's room for like TV, but is there any difference when it comes to like feature animation when entering the writer's room? Because I know it's not episodic, it's more of a like development over a couple of years. Okay, yes. So there's not really a writer's room in feature, right? You're usually going to have like one, let's say the guy or the gal that they bought the, the script from, right? And then what you're going to find on feature, feature isn't like the best place to be a writer because the, if they don't like something is not working, they'll replace you and then have someone else to write on it. Um, some features, they've had like seven different writers on it and only one or two people get credit. And then it goes into a um, it goes to the writer's guild where they have a trial and they like debate on whose credit it should be right based on the percentage of what's left in that film, something like that, right? But if you want to be a writer, you want to go through uh, TV for sure, 
because that's they actually have a pipeline where they you know help you get up there is this ladder um oh my god my hair whether it like helps you or not there is that ladder up but um you want to be in tv that's where they have writers rooms that's where you meet people and feature they don't have that feature is a more even more board driven area um Thank so you. you're, gonna, you're gonna have like directors and board artists change so much like all of it um yeah a lot of them come from live action we're boarding yeah it's it's good to be a live action writer It is now uh, near the end of the presentation and q a so um, uh, if there's any last questions, um, just make sure that they're really short, <laughs> but we're going to be wrapping up uh, very soon. No more questions? Okay. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing your advice and all your experience with us. We really appreciate it. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Yeah, thanks for coming. So nice getting Thank to Thank you me. everyone for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We learned a lot. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.